All right. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, present our speaker for today. This is Drew Carrington. Uh, Drew is the lead artist at a little company called One Inch Heroes, where they do custom painting of figurines. So Drew, let us uh, tell us all about that. All righty. Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, everyone for uh, coming and watching. I appreciate you uh, taking the time out of busy Saturdays to uh, come listen to me prattle on about uh, my hobby. Um, and thank you very much for reaching out to me for the opportunity, Molly. I appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, One Inch Heroes is my uh, little company. Uh, I started uh, a little bit ago um, and uh, I collect and paint and do custom commission work for miniatures. Uh, so a uh, little bit uh, about myself. Uh, I lived in Maryland pretty much my whole life uh, with the exception of a, a couple stints here and there. Um, I've been painting miniatures uh, for about 30 years or so. Uh, I started um, I started off as like a lot of kids did, uh, probably just with uh, smaller uh, like model cars uh, and airplanes were a big uh, thing for me. Um, I started doing those and eventually one day I was riding my bike out and I went to the local comic book shop and I saw that they had these really cool like sci-fi future soldier guys and i said oh those look so cool uh and i put up decided to start painting miniatures right then and there um i've been professionally painting uh for about five years or so give or take um and uh been doing it as sort of like my side hustle and i've been uh working to transition into doing it as my full-time gig uh, I contribute work regularly to the uh, Nova Open Charitable Foundation, which is uh, the Northern Virginia uh, Gaming Convention. Uh, they have a charitable arm for uh, Doctors Without Borders and other uh, worthy charities that uh, my studio has contributed uh, pieces and parts of entire armies to before um, that they raffle off for, uh, for good cause money. Uh, and I have a regular Twitch stream called Watching Paint Dry. Uh, on Thursdays, uh, so you can check that out. I've got my social media links at the bottom of the slides. Uh, and so, yeah, that's pretty much me. Uh, that's that's me and what I'm about, and I just love painting minis. Uh, so for uh, basically the agendas here, I'm going to uh, talk about some of the materials and tools, uh, resources that I use, um, getting started, uh, and some other little things like basing and sculpting um, I'll talk about just to kind of give you an idea of uh, what's involved in uh, doing this hobby. Uh, so first up, uh, we have brushes. Um, I use a lot of fine detail brushes, uh, just you know, like the ones pictured here. You can, uh, you can probably find most of these online uh, when doing a, uh, yeah, when doing a, just a search for miniature brushes. Uh, I also use things like airbrushes, uh, which are you know, fire compressed uh, air across the paint so you can paint large pieces or get some nice blending effects. Um, the, uh, there's, you can use either natural fibers or synthetic, uh, depending on the type of effect you're going for. Um, synthetic tends to work a little bit better for some of the metallics. Um, and, uh, the, but the, the natural hair works for uh, a good number of paints and, uh, effects that you're trying to go for. I, uh, I use a, uh, a wet palette for my painting, uh, basically just a surface, uh, medium for your paints. Uh, this is something where it helps keep the paint wet so you can continue to work, um, a little bit more, uh, with the paint before it gets, uh, you know, before it dries up and makes it, you know, impossible to work with. <laughs> uh, I use water-based acrylics uh, for just about all of my uh, painting and effects. Uh, right there uh, is an example of them up on the left and on the right uh, is my workstation. Uh, so this is where all the magic happens uh, when I am putting things together and painting them. And uh, yeah, basically just creating. Uh, the you're going to need uh, glue to assemble them, just like you would any other models or kits. Uh, you're just going to have to put them together, and uh, the you know some some of them do come uh, pre-assembled, uh, but I tend to use uh, these super glue uh, components to assemble them. 
the uh, for the materials and tools, I tend to use a, like a lot of clippers. Uh, I use uh, hobby knives, that sort of thing, uh, to remove things from the sprue, which is uh, that outward uh, little surrounding bit um, that sure. uh, goes around the uh, all of the the other small uh, pieces that contain uh, everything there. I'm sorry to interrupt, but are are sure. you trying to show your slides right now? I am. The slides are not showing up on screen. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. That. Let me uh, let me try that again. Okay. Ah, uh, there we go. Yes. There we go. Okay. okay. So, uh, all right. Let's see. The uh, let's take it back a couple steps. Just uh, yeah. There we go. That's uh, that's my workstation there. Um, so a <laughs> little. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and then uh, I talked a little bit about some of the materials here, like the uh, the glue and uh, tools for assembling and cleaning uh, the pieces, because a lot of the times they have a uh, what's known as mold lines that go around the outside from where the uh, plastic or metal was injected into the mold. And you sometimes need to clean that away to get a smooth working surface. Uh, now, uh, some of the resources uh, that I really want to talk about are uh, friendly local gaming stores. Uh, there are tons of them in your area. Uh, I know plenty of them from having worked and lived in this area for a long time. They're invaluable resources for uh, supplies or talking to folks who are uh, in the hobby or know people who are. Uh, and usually a lot of the times if they don't have something, they can get something for you. Um, same goes with uh, hobby shops and with things like YouTube and Twitch. Uh, we live in a golden age of gaming and hobbying. Uh, it's from everything from uh, like tabletop games, uh, shows like Critical Role, uh, all the way to guys you know like myself who just paint uh, miniatures on stream and uh, like to talk about it. Um, there are uh, other gamers and hobbyists you can talk to to uh, uh, to learn and grow uh, and find things you might not have known. Uh, and dollar stores, uh, believe it or not, are actually a really good resource for finding all sorts of things from uh, terrain uh, to uh, basing miniatures, which I'll talk about. Uh, and they're really good resources for uh, showing what's... Uh, yeah, you know, showing what you can do with a, a small budget. Just because this is a hobby doesn't mean it necessarily has to be super expensive. Uh, so first up, uh, once you've assembled your miniatures uh, and you want to make sure that you've got everything all you know nice and clean, so you've got your work surface nice and smooth. One of the biggest things is you want to prime uh, the miniature, just like you're when you were painting uh, an actual car. Uh, priming is uh, gives it a smooth surface uh, that the paint can adhere to because if you're using water-based acrylics like I I do, uh, putting it directly on the plastic it has a tendency to bead up because uh, the water doesn't want to stick to just bare plastic. Um, and then as you go along, you can add different layers, you can add different effects. Uh, if you take a look here uh, at the example on the right under paint. Um, you can take a look at some of the battle damage uh, on the soldier's armor, uh, where it looks like he's taken a lot of dings and scrapes uh, and added things uh, like the, uh, the dust around his feet. Uh, so basing uh, is uh, just as important as painting the miniature uh, to me. I feel that uh, it's a step that is very often overlooked. Uh, I feel that it is something that uh, uh, some people can think is an afterthought, but if you're really trying to sell the piece, uh, having good basing on it can really make the difference between this is a toy and this is part of a small story. And I think that's one of the biggest things for me for miniature painting is you are telling a small story. And in doing so, you have a, a small piece that you have to work with in a very constrained space, basically, to tell the story of that miniature. What is it doing? What is it, you know, what, what is its surrounding environment and what does it represent? Uh, so looking at it as though it were a complete piece 
uh, really helps sell it. If you look at this example here, uh, this is basically just what I've shown up at the top there. It's uh, school glue, just any Elmer's white glue and playground sand, uh, which they sell in 50 pound bags for about 10 bucks uh, at most uh, local hardware stores. And this is uh, this is an investment you'll make and probably never have to do again. Uh, I've purchased one and I have a bucket that I have used for probably about 20 years that I've given out to friends and other hobbyists and enthusiasts to use and base for their own miniatures. Um, and in the example here, you can see uh, where just you know adding it down a little bit to the uh, to the card that we used here. On the right hand side is what it looks more like finished, where we've added some of the paint and some of the effects uh, to make it look like it's actually built into the side of the mountain, uh, which is one of just one of the very cool effects you can get with uh, with some of your basing. The uh, uh, and this leads us into using some other materials. Uh, you can see here, for example, on the speeder bike in the upper left, uh, I've actually used a bit of tree that I picked up from walking around with my dog, uh, which is a, a another cool way to save costs. Uh, you can find and use just about anything in your hobby, uh, which I think is so cool because you can you can really interpret and make your own stories again with the miniatures. Uh, in the next example, uh, with the character running uh, up off the pipe in sort of like a matrix style move, uh, all of this was just scrap plastic left over from other projects and uh, other things that I've used before uh, to give the uh, feeling of them moving through a like warehouse or a rusted destroyed starship uh, in this case. And again, it's telling a story. What what is about this character? You know, who what are you know what are they about? What does it say about their environment that they're moving through? Uh, in the upper right, uh, you could see uh, this is a, a, a combat medic for one of the uh, the many games uh, that these miniatures can be associated with. Um, I've used uh, old pieces of terrain. And in fact, uh, you can see that there's uh, a miniature sort of version of him underneath his foot uh, to sort of give the effect that he's retrieving uh, the, you know, the, the organs or the, the medical information from the, uh, you know, from the deceased soldier. And then uh, below that, uh, we've used another piece of terrain uh, that's just some scrap bits that uh, I've added things with uh, lots of metallics uh, to look like rust and then gone over it to build that story of it being in a ruined cityscape by adding the verdigree or weathering uh, to the device itself. The, uh, this is also enhanced by the, uh, the bricks on the base. And again, that's, that's, a, that's one of the points I keep coming back to. And it's one thing I try to impress on, on everyone I talk to about the miniatures is you're telling that story. You're building that idea around just the miniature and working within that, that, that space to tell the story of that miniature. Um, one of the things uh, that I like to do is use uh, all sorts of materials. You can see here again um, on the, the left-hand side, uh, I actually sculpted uh, this piece. This is uh, a piece that was made uh, with various other bits that I just sort of cobbled together. The, uh, the plastic sort of jar that he's living in is uh, some sort of spray cap that I picked up off the street again, just while walking my dog. Um, and it's, it's seeing things like that and finding inspiration in the world around you to help build these small worlds. The, uh, in this case, uh, I was sort of going for like a horror, uh, aspect where I've built this sort of very grim, dark monster, basically, uh, in, uh, floating in the, in the jar, I've used things like, uh, guitar string. Uh, that you could see poking into his back to not only give the illusion that he's floating, uh, but also that he's sort of like powered or you know, sustained by these things. So it's you know looking again at this thing and seeing what is his story 
and in this case, I have made uh, a little bit of a story for him on my social media where he's uh, sort of a uh, a mutant who has psychic abilities, but he can't live outside of his uh, environment suit uh, as it as it is. Uh, so he's uh, sort of trapped in sort of this like sad, you know, state of stasis uh, where he can't ever experience the world outside of him, even if he can move around it. Um, and next, uh, next to him, we have the uh, uh, another story again uh, is the uh, navigator. Uh, for this little war band that I was putting together. In this case, uh, this is a guy who uh, uses his uh, his mutant abilities to steer starships. Uh, and without them, uh, the starship is basically lost. Uh, but due to his genetic gift, he's kind of a monster. Uh, so again, I just wanted to to tell that story of him, you know, existing in this framework inside of, uh, you know, these, these little mini dioramas um next to next to him uh going back to the basing uh in this case i have built it up to tell the story of this uh this armored giant on this motorcycle basically dodging an explosion so the the thing is with these with a lot of the war games that these go to the you want to build them to be sort of uniform, but adding things like this to the base can sell more of the story. Uh, it can tell of the conflict that they're in. Even if you don't know anything else about this piece, it informs you of the story. And for me, I think that's, it's one of the biggest things that drew me to miniatures was being able to pour out the, the creative expressions in my head for these sorts of things. Uh, so that being said, it's, it's just an incredibly fun thing for me to be able to make these worlds. And there's, there's tons of inspiration. I take tons of inspiration from, you know, action movies, just from the environment I see around me. I, I take pictures of weathered, you know, rusted fence posts or concrete and, you know, broken, uh, steel and stuff, just things that I see in my everyday environment that I like to recreate as inspiration for some of these pieces. Um, now, we uh, can move into uh, part of the hobby is sculpting. And once uh, you get to a point where you want to create and tell bigger stories with your miniatures, this is uh, an example here of I had these two miniatures and they weren't quite what I was looking for. So I had to take it upon myself to make them. Uh, and again, this is, uh, this is just using different materials designed specifically for the hobby. Uh, this, for example, is a uh, two-part epoxy that you mix together. It's a, a blue and a yellow. Uh, you mix it together uh, and it turns green so you can sculpt it. Uh, and then it just air hardens. The, uh, it's called Nidatite. Uh, but is actually uh, referred to in the the miniature community as just green stuff. Uh, so the the green stuff here, uh, you can use all sorts of materials. I used pins and the edges of exacto knives and paper clips, all sorts of stuff you can use on a budget to make these these uh, sculptures, and then follow it up just by painting them like normal. Uh, so. In, in this case, it's, again, uh, telling more of the story, informing more of what the miniature is about. Uh, in this case, on the right-hand side, we uh, this was a commission piece that was a uh, uh, for a Dungeons & Dragons campaign. Uh, this is a tabaxi bard. Uh, and I was told just to make him extremely colorful, uh, which I had a lot of fun doing. I, I really enjoyed this piece. Uh, the, you can even build it up. Uh, a lot of the miniatures I've showed up until now, those miniatures are uh, being used for a game. And the, the games themselves will dictate uh, the, you know, basically how big of a base you can have, uh, that sort of thing. In this case, for dioramas, you don't even necessarily have to do it just for gaming. You can also do it just for pleasure. Uh, you can just make miniatures for yourself. And I do that a lot of the time here, uh, for example, in making dioramas where the, the miniature is larger, but still telling the story. 
Um, the one on the left is actually a recreation of a garden in England uh, that uh, I was tasked with making as the, um, the client had spent some time there. It was a very special thing. So I had to do a lot of research and this is actually um, almost a one-for-one -one reproduction of that uh, little well uh, over in England. Uh, next to that is uh, I just had a kind of a futuristic warrior and I built up the, the tree there. Uh, that's, um, uh, that was a lot of wire and surprisingly the bark of the tree is actually just toilet paper with watered down uh, Elmer's glue and then wrapped around it uh, to make it look like the tree. Uh, I then added uh, some other little things like uh, the vines are made out of some of that aforementioned green stuff, uh, some more wires and thread uh, to really sell that story of him being in the jungle uh, and, you know, just sort of tell his tale. The, uh, the next piece on the right is a, you know, is I wanted to tell the story of a uh, like a young warrior who was going out on her first adventuring journey. Uh, this is something that uh, I kind of got in my head that I just wanted to build like a, a much larger piece. And there's a lot of different things in here. Um, the the steps are just made out of slate that I picked up on a hike. Um, I, I tend to use a lot of found and natural materials in my work, uh, which is uh, it. it if you can get the, you know, basically that you can't beat stone for making stone. Uh, so finding those natural uh, things to add to the miniatures are a really, really cool and fun thing that helps sell the effect and sell the story. Um, the uh, There's lots of uh, fun little, you know, miniature things. I've sculpted uh, quite a lot in that one, um, except for uh, the miniature itself. And it's, it's again the going back to the tale, uh, you know, telling the the tale of all the miniatures in in each one of these, each one of these women, uh, in their different poses and environments, each tells a different story. Uh, you know, in the first one, you can see, see the emotion of fear or you know concern. In the next one, it's very confident, uh, which are all things that are you know again going back to to telling the tale of them, and that's the biggest thing for me. Uh, I know I keep going back to that and uh, and harping on that, but I, I think that's that's what appeals to me so much about this hobby is building and creating and telling a story uh, that you're able to interpret from the miniature itself. Um, terrain is another part of uh, the hobby aspect, which you can also build, this is sort of like a mini diorama and a lot of the, the war games and other miniature games uh, can be improved through the use of building up a battlefield or a scenario in which these things fit. Um, going, uh, going back again to my budget uh, on the first uh, image on the left there, uh, that is one of my first attempts at building terrain when I was a, a very young man. Uh, and that is actually a uh, for a crashed escape pod is made out of a uh, soda can uh, with just some other little bits uh, added to it, uh, which it's also, I did not use miniature paint on this. I used uh, basic paint, you know, just from the craft store, which again, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're just starting out or you just want to try out miniature painting, you know, it's way better to get, uh, you know, like a cheap uh, affordable set and work up with it. You don't even need to get uh, the like super crazy expensive miniatures or anything. Go to the dollar store, going back to our resources, you can get a bag of army men for a couple of bucks and they're not going to you know blow the doors off in terms of detail, but they'll give you a good starting point of something where you just want to try it out. Uh, matchbox cars are another real good example of just wanting to try out something, you can get those for a dollar at most uh, like big box or dollar stores. Uh, and you can just prime them, paint them and go to town on them. And uh, even though they're just a little car, you can still tell a story with those. Uh, some of my later attempts here, uh, as you can see, I built this farmhouse uh, out of some uh, poster board, uh, some coffee stirrer sticks, uh, for the fence and for the the wood paneling and the 
uh, roof of this piece is actually just teddy bear fur fabric uh, matted down with glue. Uh, and in the next piece, uh, this was just built out of some uh, what's called foam core. Uh, it's basically the stuff that you use for science fair projects uh, for your display board uh, that has a bit of uh, styrofoam sandwich between uh, stiff paper. Uh, it's a really great building material because uh, it holds its shape and you can sculpt it and add a bunch of texture to it and it works. You can paint just right over it like a miniature. Uh, in this case, this combines the best of both worlds because I've actually included a miniature in the center of it to make it look like it's a little sort of town fountain uh, that we use uh, in a lot of our uh, tabletop games uh, just to you know, add a little bit of flavor to, again, extend the tail of, of what you're working on. So uh, that's uh, that's uh, basically just me talking about the process. Uh, that's you know quite a lot. Um, uh, I think I've been going for about a half hour now. Uh, so uh, we can do some questions. I can show off uh, some of the, the painting itself here. Uh, if uh, that's think, what we want to do. I think we would love it if we could see uh, some of your painting set up. All right. Um, so let's see. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing is... the uh, the also, thing there. Everybody, if you have questions for Drew about his process, about the stuff that he uses, um, various things like that, uh, go to the Q and A button and uh, put your question in there. Uh, you can also type them in chat, uh, and I'll give give everybody a few minutes to put their questions in. Okay. Uh, I've pulled up my video there to the uh, to the desk. So this is your workspace that we're looking at. Yeah, right now. this is my my workspace here. Um, I've got uh, one of my uh, futuristic soldier guys here, and uh, I can go in and uh, give him a give him a little bit of the the next layer. Uh, so in this case, uh, what I've done for this miniature is he's already been primed and I used an airbrush to get down the, uh, the first layer uh, of paint on him. And what I'm going to do is go in and give it a little bit of highlights. Uh, so I'm just going to go in and start picking out some of the, uh, some of the detail here and filling, uh, filling out where light is naturally going to hit. Uh, and just sort of hit those those hard edges uh, to to make it look a little bit more realistic in terms of uh, the the texture itself. In this case, armor is a, a hard, shiny surface, uh, so you're going to stick to a lot of like the hard edges, uh, and the the larger flat panels are where you're really going to see a lot of light show up. So just going. Uh, going around here on the, the outside edge of his pauldron. Which is uh, shoulder armor uh, for folks who uh, are not as uh, big a nerd about uh, armor as I am. I have a feeling many people here are going to also be armor nerds. You know what, that is, that is completely fair and valid. <laughs> So the uh, yeah, so this is uh, this is basically the process of just going through and uh, just having fun and painting and telling you know telling the story of the miniature in your head. Um, one of the one of the things that I've done is uh, just to tell some more of the story, but also to break up the monotony because you have to paint an awful lot of these guys if you're you know building a whole army of them for a game. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I've just uh, I've given them some different poses. So like here's this this trooper sort of stalking forward. And here is uh, this trooper who's pointing uh, and holding his rifle up uh, as so just a just a little bit of fun to, to make them seem more individualized, which can kind of get lost, uh, especially on these guys because they're all wearing basically the same protective suit of armor. Yeah. 
Well, Drew, it looks like we have a bunch of questions. Are you okay. ready to answer some? Hit me. Let's do it. All right. Um, one question from Byron. Uh, can you talk about using washes? I've bought some, but I haven't used them yet. I sure can. Uh, so washes are uh, sort of like an ink that you're going to put over a, a main color. Uh, washes can be used to alter the tint of the, uh, of the paint itself. Uh, and it can also be used to go into the recesses of miniatures to uh, give them shade and shadow effects uh, in some of the, the recesses of the miniature naturally. Uh, for those, you can water them down uh, and sort of build them up uh, or apply them straight out of the pot. Uh, I tend to uh, I tend to thin them down a little bit and just basically go over um, the the miniature itself, uh, and that way you can always 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 add more paint, but it's really hard to take it away. So if you're uh, careful and just sort of build it up as you go, uh, then it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty much just like painting, but very thin. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a question from the paleontologist. Uh, could you please spell the name of the sculpting medium you use, the green stuff? Yes. Uh, Nidatite is K-N-E-A-D-A-T-I-T-E. -E. So it's need like K-N-E-A-D. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. Yep. Need like you're making bread. And then... A-T-I-T, -T, like the word tight, but grammatically horrible. Okay. <laughs> um, and you can actually find uh, quite a lot of resources for that uh, simply by typing in green stuff, uh, all as one word. And it's a type of epoxy putty. Correct. Yep, it's a okay. two part. So you mix the, the yellow and the blue and it makes green. Oh, I actually found the main website for it. So I'm going to drop that in chat. There you go. It's like knead and stick tightly, knead a tight. Yep. <laughs> um, so in chat right now, I've put in the website for knead a tight. It's the official business website. It's not an Amazon link. Uh, we got Drew's website and also Drew's Instagram, if you want to check those out. Um, Let's see, uh, another question. Let's see, um, can you explain the wet palette setup? Yes, uh, the wet palette, uh, for example, the one that I have here is actually a, uh, this is a commercially available one uh, from the, uh, the miniatures company, Army Painter. Uh, and basically what a wet palette consists of is a sponge uh, and a piece of uh, membranous paper that goes over it. Uh, and you wet the sponge and put the paper on top of it to uh, get moist. And then you can put the paint uh, directly onto the paper and it doesn't soak through, uh, but the water from underneath in the sponge will so that the paint stays thin and workable. Uh, and one of the things that's great about it is you can basically, as long as your sponge is wet, you can close your palette and come back to it days later and still use that same color. So it's very economical for uh, a supply standpoint, uh, but also just from working, because you know life happens. Sometimes you got to go take a phone call, or you have to run out for something, uh, you know. And you want to come back to your minis, but you don't want a whole bunch of dried paint. Um, one of the cool things about a wet palette is you can make it with stuff from the dollar store. Uh, you can, for the sponge, you can substitute uh, just a paper towel folded up. Um, the special paper, uh, you can use baking parchment and the, uh, container can just be a, uh, Tupperware. Uh, you nestle the, uh, the, the, uh, the wet paper towel and the parchment paper in the lid. Uh, so you have a nice low profile for it. Like I do here. Uh, and then all you have to do is put the lid on and snap it closed and you have a cheap, easy wet palette. Nice. Yeah, I don't do stuff on the same level that you do, but I have painted several uh, simple things recently, and the paint drying out has been a struggle. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it's such a bummer because, you know, you always want to, you want to get right back to your painting sometimes, you know, I, I could tell you how many times I've come home from work and just been like, oh boy, it's time to paint. <laughs> and, you know, having a wet palette may, really helps facilitate that. Um, let's see. Anonymous asked, how much do you use black contrasting color paint versus washes to add depth to your minis? Uh, I find that they are uh, very interchangeable, as a matter of fact. Uh, the contrast paints uh, are a special type of paint uh, made by Citadel Color uh, that are basically, uh, they are formulated to go over top of uh, a white primer, uh, in this case, and it helps give natural depth and shade uh, and a little bit of highlighting in one go. Uh, they can be a little tricky to use, but if you use them in the same manner as washes, you can get a lot of the same effects. Um, I, I basically like to think of them as uh, sort of like a pre-made glaze uh, in that effect. Uh, and glazes are uh, similar to washes, but uh, just a little bit thinner. Uh, so you're basically just putting very thin layers of shade over top uh, of the, the piece rather than completely shading it with one go. Uh, I do tend to use uh, some of the uh, the Black Citadel uh, contrast on um, uh, weapons. Uh, it works really well because it, uh, it tends to give them a lot of natural shade and make them look kind of like uh, oily and, you know, well-maintained. Nice. Uh, could you tell us more about doing the grim dark style with oils? I, the okay so uh, the the grim dark style with oils um, you can use uh, some oil paints and washes to sort of build up uh, and it they work a little differently than the acrylics because you're gonna be you're gonna be building um, you're gonna be building different layers with uh, with oil washes uh, and the the grim dark style uh, the the best way i can put it is basically just take just take the filthiest stuff you can imagine and uh like in the example i showed with my floating uh monster in a jar i basically i just went through and put on uh like on his skin i did some some green and some purples and reds uh just to make him look kind of diseased and horrible and uh, yeah, uh, made all of the metal on it really grungy. Uh, his base has nothing but rust. Uh, so just you know, the the worst sort of scenario imaginable um, is kind of the grim dark style. And there's the best thing about it is is everyone's interpretation of it is correct. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question about I guess the base figurine itself. Sure. Um, you talked about using, uh, taking base figurines and putting little clothes on them or whatever, using the green stuff. Um, do you ever use 3D printed figurines as a base? Are they? Uh, they have I have, as base? a matter of fact. Uh, I actually own uh, a couple of 3D printers uh, and I have used them to print out uh, pieces for uh, terrain. Uh, I've used them to print out uh, just like alternate heads for miniatures or entire miniatures themselves uh, for the uh, for the purpose of painting. And uh, I am I am a big advocate of where the hobby is going in mm. relation to 3D printing. Nice. Do you prepare the 3D printed figurines differently than you would, I guess, a cast or molded one since they're plastic? <laughs> Uh, not particularly. Um, the 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 prints that come out uh, are resin, so they're just a, a different type of plastic. Oh, okay. Um, you so I uh, I tend to just uh, prepare and paint them pretty much exactly the same way. Yeah, I'm asking because um, over at the labs we have uh, PLA mostly for our prints. Okay. Uh, which is a little bit different to use. Uh, I've read that they recommend you put some kind of sealant down first because PLA is uh, right. biodegradable. Um, uh, yes, uh, and, and going over it with, uh, with the primer uh, mm -hmm. usually works pretty well. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I've used actually a lot for, um, for PLA prints uh, because they tend to uh, be a little thicker. They have yeah. uh, like some uh, the, the print lines or striations 
uh, can be picked up and it makes for a difficult surface to paint over because uh, they're not yeah. smooth. Uh, however, you can get at uh, pretty much any hardware store automotive primer. Uh, and automotive oh. primer uh, has natural filler in it. So if you spray over PLA prints, uh, it will help fill in some of those uh, striation lines. And if you hit it with about two to three coats of that primer, you will barely see those lines anymore. Oh, that's a great tip. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, I just want to see more beautifully painted miniatures in the world. Like that's yeah. that's my jam. Uh, let's see. We have a question about glaze. Speaking of glaze, what is the best product for protecting the mini so that as you repeatedly move them around on your table, you prevent the paint from rubbing off? Uh, a lot of the times, uh, one of the reasons that I really enjoy using uh, acrylics as a medium is when it dries, uh, it basically turns into a plastic shell. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to, uh, you know, coat it. But um, one of the one of the great uh, products that I use is a uh, Tester's Dull Coat, uh, okay. which is a uh, it's a matte finish. Uh, so if you have anything that's like super shiny uh, or metallic, you may need to paint back over it with uh, a gloss varnish. Uh, but yeah, hitting it with uh, hitting it with a quick spray of the uh, Tester's Dull Coat will uh, will provide uh, years of protection. I, I've had miniatures completely fall off the table, and even though they broke, their paint wasn't chipped. So. <laughs> Uh, it looks like I'm, I'm going to find the link for that one too. Testers is spelled T S T O R S. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Can I drop the link there? And also for everybody that's like, oh my gosh, there are so many links. Uh, after our talks, we do send out a little summary email that has uh, the links to everything. So it'll be things like, um, Drew's website and uh, a lot of the things that we talked about today. So if you don't manage to get uh, the links in the live talk, that is okay. There will be a second chance. Okay. Um, oh, great. We are getting close to the end, but we can probably take a couple more questions uh, before we uh, Let's do it. Do everything else. So uh, everybody, type in your questions now. Uh, you mentioned that you had a Twitch show called uh, Watching Paint Dry, and it's every Thursday? That's correct. Um, uh, my, uh, can, yeah, that's on yeah. my Twitch stream, uh, which is just the twitch.tv slash one inch heroes. Uh, can you tell us anything about who you're going to have? Are you going to have a guest on Thursday? Do you just talk about? Um, a lot of the times, uh, it's just me uh, painting and giving my thoughts and, and techniques out uh, while, I, while I paint. Um, Sometimes uh, I have uh, a, a good friend of mine on who is also one of the artists for One Inch Heroes. Uh, he uh, comes and joins me on my stream from time to time. Um, his uh, Twitch is uh, Holy Fireman. Holy Fireman. <laughs> um, is it H O L Y? That is uh, correct. Okay. And yeah, that's uh, sometimes we go on and, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we just kind of shoot the breeze and paint and talk about things. Um, yeah, we're, we're pretty silly. We have a very laid back attitude about it. Uh, it's, it's uh, fun for all. Uh, so sometimes, uh, sometimes maybe not for the younger kids, depending on the, the material we're working on or that sort of thing, or, you know, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's a lot of fun uh, and we always enjoy it. All right, uh, Scott and Max ask, could you comment on chippering medium, uh, adding textures, etc.? cetera? Uh, chipping medium uh, is really cool. Uh, what, you, what you can do with chipping medium uh, is you put it down, you paint a base color. Uh, for example, let's say you were doing some rust on some armor. You would paint the, the dark browns and oranges of the rust first. Uh, then you would put down a, uh, like a clear coat uh, over top of it. Then if you put the chipping medium down, uh, you can, once it dries, you can paint another color on top of it. When it dries, you can then rub the top color off, uh, either using like a stiff bristled brush or uh, a toothpick 
uh, to give like chips and scratches and it will reveal the color underneath it. Um, there's uh, And there's lots of things out there that you can use to add a lot of different textures. Uh, there are textured paints available. Um, the Citadel line makes uh, what they call technical paints, uh, which have uh, certain effects in them like grit uh, that you can add to the paint uh, to paint right over or just use it for the basing material, that sort of thing. Um, they have uh, one in particular just for gore effects called Blood for the Blood God, uh, which is fantastic. I actually use that on quite a lot of miniatures. It's very cool. That um, is an amazing name for a paint medium, Blood yeah. for the Blood God. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a really, uh, there's all sorts of fun different weathering techniques that you can use. Um, and one of the things that I will say is look in your environment, look around your world, uh, look at construction vehicles. Uh, if you want to see rust, look up under your car, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, look around and see what's in your world that you can translate and think about how would I make that look real on a miniature? Um, and there's, there's, like I said before, we live in a golden age uh, of this sort of hobby where you can look online for all sorts of resources. Um, and there are tons of folks who, you know, make tutorials uh, and instructional videos and that sort of thing for how to do certain effects. Can you recommend anybody in particular for effects painting? Um, well, uh, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of them. Uh, one of the ones I really like, uh, especially for building, um, building like on a budget and making really cool effects. Uh, I like the, uh, uh, black magic crafts is a pretty good one. Is it black badger or black badge? Black magic. Oh, black magic. Okay. Yeah. Black magic. Sorry. The, the, the sound is not always the best. Ah, apologies. Let me turn my mic a little closer to me. Black magic crafts. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have another question from the audience. Uh, what is your favorite brand for sable brushes, if you have one? Um, I particularly like the Windsor Newton. Uh, Windsor Newton series. Um, seven is what they're called. Uh, okay. Yeah, Windsor Newton Series Seven are probably some of my some of my brushes that see the most uh, work in my studio. We actually had um, a painter of a different kind of miniature. She did the very tiny paintings, uh, like the cameo sized ones, mm -hmm. and she also recommended the Windsors for that too. Yeah, they um, are they are very finely crafted for uh, doing this sort of work. Uh, right. They can they can be a little pricey, uh, but I I am personally of the opinion when it comes to a lot of art, you know the uh, sometimes the the pricier the tool, the better the results. Mm. Sometimes that yeah, with with paintbrushes in particular, I feel like that's yeah. one of the things that holds true. All right, I think we have time for one more question, and then unfortunately we'll have to bring this talk to an end. Anybody else? All right. Uh, it looks like, no, wait, we have one more question. All right. Uh, can you comment on the difference between metal or plastic minis? Uh, I have found that uh, when you're when you're painting, there's really not a whole terrible amount of difference in in my personal opinion. Um, I have found that uh, in some cases, uh, plastic can take detail a little bit better, so you might get some more finely detailed uh, miniatures in plastic. That's not to say I have not seen some exquisite metal uh, miniatures that are uh, that are finely detailed. Uh, the I would say about the only difference is uh, probably in cleaning and assembling. Is cleaning more difficult for one than the other or? Yeah, cleaning for the metal miniatures is gonna be a little bit more difficult uh, because you're gonna need uh, like some small metal files mm. uh, to remove any of the mold lines or any um, like miscasting spurs or anything like that that might show up on the miniature. 
um with plastic you could just sort of kind of scrape them off with the back of an exacto knife okay. uh but the uh with metal you can also do that but you run a greater risk of gouging the metal and damaging it okay so i tend to prefer using uh needle files is what they're called because they're they're just very small um and you can use it to sort of slowly remove material because just like with painting it's very easy to remove material but kind of hard to put it back like like sculpting exactly in almost any medium all right um so i think that uh that's a wrap i would say so thank you once again drew and thank you all and uh i'm gonna end the talk now and uh thank you for uh thank you for telling us so much about miniatures absolutely thank you for having me all right goodbye everybody have a great weekend